Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Vice President Pence, governors, friends, honored guests, good afternoon. It is my sincere privilege to be here with you today to talk about some of the values we have in common and some of the solutions to the challenges we all face. Governor McAuliffe, thank you for your kind words of introduction and your thoughtful opening remarks. Governor Raimondo, thank you for your warm welcome and this extraordinary Ocean State hospitality. It's high summer here in Rhode Island, land of perfect sun, sand and surf. I have to say I'm a little bit flattered and also a little bit surprised that so many of you in the audience have chosen to be here now rather than at the beach. But maybe that's on the agenda for this weekend. Or maybe, like me, you agree with Wallace Stevens that perhaps the truth depends on a walk around the lake. I have to tell you, Wallace Stevens is my favorite American poet. By day, he worked in insurance up the road in Hartford, Connecticut. And by night, he wrote some of the most thoughtful poetry this country and indeed our world has ever seen. As I get to know this beautiful, historic corner of America a little better, the neatly tended fields and low stone walls, the apple orchards and spectacular ocean vistas, I've been thinking a lot about Wallace Stevens. In his poem, Theory, he declares, I am what is around me. And it makes me think of the concept of home, what it means, and how we define it. Of course, home begins with family. It extends out from there to school and places of worship, workplace, community, city, state, and country. But there's an aspect of home that goes beyond our national borders, at least beyond the Canada-US border, which is unlike any other. That is the idea and the reality of our common North American home. This is where Newfoundlanders took in thousands of stranded American air travelers after 9-11, as chronicled in the award-winning Broadway musical, Come From Away, which you really should all see. It is, it is where 100 years ago, New Englanders rushed to help their Nova Scotia cousins after the Halifax explosion of 1917. We saw it just a few weeks ago when the Plymouth to Newport sailing race got hit with hurricane force winds and Canadian Armed Forces personnel, ships and planes went immediately into rescue mode. That's what friends and neighbors do for one another. We're there for each other. We step up. The Canada-US border is sometimes referred to as the longest undefended border in the world. That's actually wrong. Our shared border is very well defended. We defend it together against common threats. From NORAD, the only joint command relationship in the world, to NATO, to counterterrorism, to basic street level policing, Canadians and Americans work shoulder to shoulder, keeping each other safe. As long as any of us here can remember, and further back than that, we have done this. And that is the context into which I'd like to say a few words today about Canada's outreach to the United States this year, which has variously been described by analysts and pundits as un-Canadian, exceptionally Canadian, unprecedented, highly predictable, and perhaps most colorfully, a donut. In that one, I suspect you governors are all the sprinkles, but you know. <laughs> My friends, I'm here to tell you that our continuing conversation with all of you is none of those things. Not at all. On the contrary, it is consistent and solid through and through. And I need to highlight the work of two individuals here as being exemplary throughout this process. 
Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Chrystia Freeland, and our Ambassador to the United States, David McNaughton. Thank you both for your terrific work. But we all know that Christia and David are not alone in this. It extends to all levels of governance and society. From my continuing constructive dialogues with President Trump and Vice President Pence, to chats between federal ministers and cabinet secretaries, to meetings between state governors and provincial premiers, including the Premier of Ontario, Kathleen Wynne, who's here with us today, to conversations between municipal leaders, to business and non-governmental organizations, and to the thousands of personal and business ties that form the bedrock of our national bond. During my time in politics, I've noticed this. Pundits, and I say this with the greatest of respect and affection to our friends in the media, really seem to enjoy the word strategy. If you have a plan, it's just a plan. Anyone can have a plan. But if you call it a strategy, well, suddenly journalists are leafing through Sun Tzu's The Art of War and making oblique references to chess. <laughs> it has the effect of making the obvious seem complex or at least fancy. It makes for an interesting story. But our strategy, our plan, is actually extremely straightforward. Canada is a confident, creative, resourceful, and resource-rich nation. We are wealthy and influential country by world standards. But we are also a country of 35 million people living next door to one roughly 10 times our size and the world's only superpower. My father, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, once compared this to sleeping next to an elephant. But while you, my American friends, may be an elephant, Canada is no mouse. More like a moose. Strong and peaceable, but still massively outweighed. And so we need to work harder to make our points to advocate for the interests of Canadian families in a way that will connect down here. That applies across the range of our national interests, from the fight against climate change, to job creation, to our common defense. Because, let's face it, this is another truth about good neighbors. Sometimes we take each other for granted. Sometimes the very dependability and ease of a relationship can lead to us paying too little attention. When that happens, the principals invariably live to regret it. My friends, we in Canada decided we would not allow that to happen to our relationship with the United States of America. And you'll allow me to say that again for the folks back home because it's important. Il s'agit d'un autre aspect de la relation entre bons voisins. Parfois, nous la tenons pour acquise. Parfois, la fiabilité et la facilité d'une relation peuvent nous amener à y accorder trop peu d'attention. Inévitablement, on en vient à regretter de l'avoir négligé. Mes amis, je peux vous dire qu'au Canada, nous avons décidé que nous n'allions pas négliger notre relation avec les États-Unis. When I talk about the importance of maintaining this relationship, I talk about it as a collective. I say, we, because this sentiment extends throughout the cabinet and caucus I lead, but is actually bigger than our government or our political party. There is an extraordinarily high degree of support for this across Canadian society. I note, by the way, that we have representatives from two of our major political parties here today, Members of Parliament Mike Lake, Brenda Shanahan, and Salma Zahid, as well as Senators Bob Runciman and Art Eggleton. Hello, and thank you all for being here. As I was saying, the Canada-US relationship is far too important for us to assume that Americans are as focused on it as we are, focused on just how interlinked 
our economies have become, and just how crucial this is to the prosperity and security of both sides of this border, especially for the, working for the middle class and those working hard to join it. Given the imminent modernization of the North American Free Trade Agreement, which we welcome, of course, we felt compelled to tell you Canada's story, specifically as it relates to the United States. It's a great story. And not just for the nine million American workers whose jobs depend directly on trade and investment with Canada, but for all Americans. Now, some of you may have heard that last number before, along with the fact that two-thirds of American states have Canada as their number one top export market. This may have something to do with the fact that we're repeating those numbers to U.S. audiences every chance we can get. The export number is true, by the way, for a majority of the states represented here today, including Alabama, Arkansas, Colorado, Iowa, Kentucky, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, New Hampshire, North Carolina, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Tennessee, Vermont, Virginia, and Wisconsin. <laughs> to boil this down to one point, Canada is the U.S.'s biggest, best customer by far. We're a bigger customer than China by roughly $152 billion, bigger than Japan or the UK. No one else even comes close. In fact, Canada buys more from the US than China, Japan, and the UK combined. We've been consistent this year. Some might say relentless, but we're polite in our relentlessness because we're Canadian. In sharing that message, beginning in my regular dialogues with President Trump and fanning out from there. And let me tell you why. This is the most successful economic partnership in the history of the world. It's worth about a trillion dollars each year, and most importantly, it's well balanced. More broadly, the North American Free Trade Zone is the biggest economic zone in the world, comprising a $19 trillion regional market of 470 million customers. The United States, Canada, and Mexico together now account for more than a quarter of the world's GDP. Since the trilateral agreement went into effect in 1994, U.S. trade with your NAFTA partners has tripled. That accounts for millions of well-paying middle-class jobs for Canadians and Americans. Free trade has worked. It's working now. And those ties have grown well beyond direct trade. Canadians pay more than $500 million annually in property tax in Florida alone. <laughs> and another 25,000 homes in Arizona are Canadian-owned something to do with the weather, I suspect. But NAFTA isn't perfect. No such agreement ever is. We think it should be updated and modernized as it has been a dozen times over the past quarter century. And I have every expectation that it will be to the ultimate benefit of working people in all three partner countries. And I have to add this. We've been gratified by the serious, respectful response that our outreach has met at all levels of American government. We thank our counterparts in the Trump administration for that, and we thank all of you. The relationship between our countries is historic. It is a model to the world. It is of critical importance for people on both sides of the border that we maintain and, indeed, improve it. We must get this right. And sometimes getting it right means refusing to take the politically tempting shortcuts. More trade barriers, more local content provisions, more preferential access for homegrown players and government procurement, for example, does not help working families over the long term or even the midterm. Such policies kill growth. 
And that hurts the very workers these measures are nominally intended to protect. And once we travel down that road, it can quickly become a cycle of tit for tat, a race to the bottom, where all sides lose. My friends, Canada doesn't want to go there. If anything, we'd like a thinner border for trade, not a thicker one. And allow me once again to repeat that in French. La relation entre nos pays n'a pas d'égal. Elle sert d'exemple au monde entier et il est d'une importance critique pour les gens qui vivent des deux côtés de la frontière, qu'on la maintienne et en fait qu'on l'améliore. Il faut que ce soit fait correctement. Parfois, faire les choses correctement ne veut pas dire nécessairement emprunter le chemin le plus facile sur le plan politique ni le chemin le plus court. Créer de nouvelles barrières commerciales, ajouter davantage d'obligations de contenu local, donner un accès plus privilégié à des acteurs locaux pour les contrats gouvernementaux, par exemple, n'aide pas les familles de la classe moyenne à long terme ni même à moyen terme. Les politiques de ce genre affaiblissent la croissance et nuisent aux travailleurs qu'elles devraient protéger. Une telle approche peut facilement engendrer une dynamique de représailles mutuelles de laquelle personne ne sort gagnant. Now, there are some really great arguments to be made for keeping our border thin when it comes to trade, even as we improve cross-border law enforcement that makes Canadians and Americans safer. Our friends and partners in Michigan and Ohio know well the case of Magna International, a global automotive parts supplier headquartered in Ontario. Founded in 1957, Magna today employs nearly 140,000 workers in 29 countries. Half of those workers are here in North America. And Magna has 65 facilities in the United States, 60 in Canada, and 29 in Mexico. And here's the point. Magna's supply chain spans the border. To a car park, the border is invisible. Canadian components are repeatedly incorporated into more complex products before final assembly. A hydroformed upper cross member starts in Strathroy, Ontario. It's imported into Michigan for assembly into a carrier and then incorporated into a full front end module in Ohio. Magna then sends the front end modules to Chrysler for final assembly. And Chrysler exports the finished Jeeps right around the world. That's teamwork, my friends. Or take Can-Am Group, the parent company of Can-Am Steel. Can-Am is headquartered in Quebec. It employs roughly equal numbers of Canadians and Americans. Its plant in Point of Rock, Maryland, and Claremont, New Hampshire provide jobs that are vital to their communities. Can-Am's market is the construction industry, which is a North American-wide industry. There are literally too many examples of this to name. Whether it's CN in Louisiana, or Hydro-Quebec in Maine, or Cot Corporation in Missouri, or countless other enterprises and projects across the states, Canadian energy, ingenuity, and capital are there helping you build America, just as American in energy, ingenuity, and capital are in Canada helping us build our country. And this, ultimately, is why I have such confidence in our shared future. And in the best efforts of every leader in this room and in Washington to nurture this relationship, to make it even better, we really are all in this together. Ambassador McNaughton remarked on the high degree of cooperation and collegiality among the state governors he talked to, including many of you. That pragmatic approach crosses party lines. And I know that's because, as governors, you face common problems and share many of the same goals. I know that you're focused on creating the conditions for good, well-paying jobs for the middle class in your states. Whether Republican or Democrat, in this economy, that's most likely your very first priority. Well, guess what? It's my first priority as well. President Trump has told us all that it's his first priority. We all have this in common. 
this challenge. How to ensure benefits of commerce and trade are more broadly shared so that every family can look forward to a brighter future is among the most fundamental of our time. My friends, I believe to my core that the most important challenge we face as elected leaders is that of creating lasting conditions for prosperity and security for all our people in this, our shared North American home. By virtue of our geography, by virtue of our interlinked economies, this is work we are called to do together within a modernized, renewed, and strengthened North American free trade agreement. So I will leave you with this. Let us meet this challenge. Let us keep talking as neighbors and friends should. Let us roll up our sleeves. Let's get to work and let's keep making history together. Merci beaucoup tout le monde.